At this time, I would like to introduce the first round table and introduce Rani Kota, who is going to lead that. She will introduce her people. Rani is uh, the senior strategist for the Global Health Initiatives at the Monk School of Public Affairs, University of Toronto. Uh, I believe a lot of you know her, will have worked with her, and uh, her main goal is also to develop the Institute for Global Health Equity and Innovation, which is a university-wide research focused on developing collaborations at the intersection of health, equity, and innovation. She has a lot of experience, and I cannot read them all because I really want to have time for the discussion now. But I will go as far as to give a little bit on her background. She has received her law degree from Boston College Law School and her master's in public health from Boston University. And of course, like always, a lot of the other information can be found on the WOMS website. Rani, please. Good afternoon. Excuse me because I have a bit of a cold, so just bear with me. My name is Rani Kotha, and I'm representing the University of Toronto Institute for Global Health Equity and Innovation, the sponsor of today's panel. You can read more about me in the program, and as Jurgen said, on the website. The Institute is a university-wide entity promoting research, education, and training at the intersection of health, equity, and innovation, and is housed in the Dalmana School of Public Health. This panel is part of two of the Institute's signature programs, the Safe Spaces Initiative, a commitment to providing a space and place within the academy to ask the unaskable questions, and for tough conversations about taboo subjects, so that we can become comfortable with discussing the uncomfortable. And an initiative entitled Power, Privilege, and Politics. What really determines global health inequities? <coughs> Excuse me. This panel's discussion will focus on violence against women and gender-based violence in immigrant, refugee, and non-status women in Canada. I'll be providing some foundational thoughts, hopefully some thought-provoking thoughts and ideas that will be expanded on by my colleagues. Violence against women is a global public health problem of epidemic proportions, a gross violation of human rights, that has been historically hidden, ignored, or accepted. Rape has often been a matter of stigma for the victim rather than the perpetrator. Violence in the home has been considered a private affair. Other forms of violence driven by gender inequality include forced and early marriage, sex trafficking, female genital mutilation, honor crimes, and other harmful practices. Despite global estimates that one in every three women will experience physical violence, sexual violence, or both, from an intimate partner or sexual violence from someone other than a partner in her lifetime, leading to substantial health effects that are important determinants of morbidity and mortality, it's easy to turn one's head and close one's eyes to the issues. Violence against women affects all aspects of women's health, physical, sexual, reproductive, mental, and behavioral health. The health consequences of gender-based violence can be both immediate and acute, as well as long-lasting and chronic. In fact, negative health consequences may persist long after the violence has stopped. 
Research shows that women who experience gender-based violence, such as rape, sexual assault, and intimate partner physical violence, are at increased risk to develop mental health disorders in their lifetime, including depression, stress-related syndromes, such as post-traumatic stress disorder, chemical dependency, substance abuse, and suicide. Thus, it is critically important to address gender-based violence in women's mental health promotion. While violence against women occurs daily in epidemic proportions and causes widespread morbidity and death, it cannot be resolved with a classic clinical intervention, such as identifying a pathogen, a drug, or a vaccine. Globally, violence against women is a widespread social problem rooted in the unequal distribution of resources and power between men and women, and institutionalized through laws, policies, and social norms that grant preferential rights to men. Initially, research into the causes of violence focused on single-issue explanations, such as personality or mental health disorders, history of sexual abuse or substance abuse in the perpetrators and victims. However, now it's widely recognized to result from a complex interplay of individual, relationship, community, and societal factors. Now let's look at what's happening in Canada. Estimates suggest that one in six women are abused each year, and every six days, a Canadian woman is killed by an intimate partner. So we can see that this is a problem here, too. So let's be even more specific and talk about what's happening, say, in my immigrant group, South Asians. We are one of the fastest growing ethno-racial groups in Canada, and Statistics Canada estimates that by the year 2017, there will be more than one million South Asians residing in the greater Toronto area. Now we've heard untold number of stories of the violence perpetrated on women and girls in South Asia, particularly in India and Pakistan. When looking at this issue, some scholars attribute domestic violence to the patriarchal culture in South Asian families. In other words, gender-based oppression is grounded in the patriarchal nature of the culture. South Asian girls and women are expected to play a subservient role in the family. The idea of the good daughter, or the good wife, or even the good daughter-in-law to maintain harmony within the home and unity within the community. So what happens when a South Asian person like me immigrates here to Canada? Well, it seems that my race and ethnicity gives visibility to my culture and may influence a selective understanding of my culture. In other words, it doesn't matter if I, as a South Asian woman, immigrated to Canada from the US, as I did in 2012, instead of from India. My race and ethnicity may be equated with an outmoded, frozen, static idea of my culture the South Asian or Indian culture, and ascribes to me a certain way of being, behaving, certain stereotypes, that my culture is more sexist in comparison to white Canadian culture, that I may be subordinated by my culture, even if this is not true, even if this is not my lived reality, even if the true comparison is that I from the US, not from India. Perhaps without meaning to, white dominant culture may view me or others of my group as behaving in a culturally determined way, and thus may be perpetuating stereotypes without meaning to. 
For example, in the case of domestic violence against South Asian immigrant women, it may be selectively understood as these things happen due to cultural differences. And thus, with a shrug of the shoulders, nothing can really be done about it. This kind of thinking lets those in power off the hook, so to speak. It's another way of closing the eyes and turning the head. Can we merely write off domestic violence occurring within the South Asian immigrant community in Canada as an outcome of violent and inferior cultural practices? One can argue that violence against women is a universal, global issue, not just a South Asian issue, happening throughout the world, across race, across religion, and across class. We need to shift the perspective from pathologizing or merely blaming South Asian culture towards a more critically informed perspective on factors that contribute to domestic violence in immigrant communities in Canada. Shifting the current perception from a cultural issue to one that is a social issue. What if at the heart of this issue is that we're equating cultural difference with inferiority as a means of discrimination and judgment? Because perhaps without meaning to, culture becomes wrapped up in race and ethnicity, becoming a racism that is not seen and one that is often denied. How often have I heard in my three years in Canada that we aren't the United States? We in Canada are much more tolerant. We embrace multiculturalism. We're not a melting pot, but a mosaic. We don't, have a we don't have the racialized history that the U.S. has or the history of colonization that the U.K. has. Yet this country has a deep history of racism, including genocide of Aboriginal people, poor treatment of indentured Chinese laborers in the 1880s, violating the human rights of Indian and South Asian immigrants in the 1900s, the internment of the Japanese during World War II, and more recently, regressive and punitive immigration policies. A former law professor of mine, Kimberly Crenshaw, world-renowned for her work on critical race and critical gender theory, once noted that domestic violence could also be the consequence of discrimination against racialized non-white men. In her case, she was speaking about black men and domestic violence. However, one could argue the same for South Asian men. In other words, there's a link between racism and patriarchy that denies, in this case, immigrant men of color the power and the privilege that dominant white men enjoy. And this powerlessness can have a devastating impact in the form of domestic violence in immigrant families of color. What if we look at domestic violence within the community, partially as an issue of patriarchy and power, but also in the light of the immigrant experience to Canada? Suddenly, one can see that family units that had never known violence before suddenly turn to violence within the family or experience violence, perhaps as a means of coping with the extreme stress that immigrants to Canada face. This certainly should not be used as an excuse to condone violence against women. It doesn't explain all cases, but it is something to think about. In fact, perhaps the stressors in the migration, post-migration and resettlement process perpetuated by various ways to subordinate immigrants based on race, ethnicity, and class leads to shifts in power dynamics within the family. Perhaps unanticipated social and economic barriers such as unemployment, underemployment, and de-skilling 
the process by which an immigrant's education and or employment skills, which they obtained in their country of origin, are not recognized in Canada, whether by devaluing foreign education or work experiences or by insisting on Canadian experience, thereby making it difficult or impossible for a person to be gainfully employed in one's field of expertise. Instead, forcing that person to take on a low-paid, low-skilled job instead. Racialized immigrants have not fared well economically here, despite higher levels of education and professional training. Evidence from the Wellesley Institute, a Toronto think tank, suggests that 40% of university-educated immigrant women are likely to be employed in low-skill, low-wage jobs, as opposed to 12% of native-born women. According to Statistics Canada, recent immigrant women earned 56 cents for each dollar earned by Canadian-born women, again, controlling for education. The numbers are even worse if you compare racialized women immigrants to non-racialized men. Why is it that Toronto Public Health notes that newcomers from racialized groups experience deteriorating health over time? It's easy to ascribe this to taking on a Western lifestyle. Bigger portions, less exercise, a more sedentary lifestyle, However, their studies have shown that it may be due to a high prevalence of racial discrimination, or in the case of women, racial and gender discrimination, which then becomes associated with high stress and poor health. Facing barriers inherent in the migration process to Canada and barriers in the Canadian labor market, unable to work in their fields of expertise, facing significant income inequity, facing multiple forms of discrimination, can contribute to stress, family conflict, increasing a woman's vulnerability to partner violence in Canada. So to go back to the discussion about culture, we may need to reconceptualize violence against women within immigrant communities as social and political issues grounded in patriarchy, as well as structural and institutional violence that immigrant women and men experience on a daily basis in the greater Toronto area and Canada. Traditional approaches to domestic violence focusing on patriarchy alone cannot be effective in responding to these issues. So with that thought, I'm now going to introduce you to our first speaker, Kritika Ghosh. Please note that all of the speakers' bios are in the program, so I won't repeat everything. Kritika has been working in the social services sector in both the U.S. and Canada for 15 years on issues such as violence against women, domestic workers' rights, and post-9-11 hate crimes against South Asians and Muslims. Kritika is currently a senior coordinator of the Violence Against Women Project at the Ontario Council of Agencies Serving Immigrants. She graduated with a bachelor's degree in sociology and women's studies from Simmons College in Boston, and with a master's degree in gender studies from the London School of Economics in the UK. Please join me in welcoming Kritika. Good afternoon, everybody. How are you? And that doesn't sound very good. It's, uh, it sounds like you're in your post-lunch food coma. It looked like there was some really good food out there. But I'm um, really glad to see so many of you here. And um, I will um, be put emphasizing certain sections more than others because Rani did address a lot of the stuff that I was going to talk about at the beginning of my presentation. But I um, think that sometimes Hearing something more than once kind of 
filters and more um, better. So as Rani mentioned, I am um, from OCASI, the Ontario Council of Agencies Serving Immigrants. And we've been around for about uh, 36 years now. And we're an umbrella agency of um, all immigrant, well, not all, but of, of 220 uh, immigrant and refugee serving agencies across the province. And our mission is to achieve equality, access, and full participation for immigrants and refugees in every aspect of Canadian life. In terms of the VAW project, um, we offer free trainings, online trainings and in-person trainings to settlement workers on different topics. I'm not gonna go read through all of them, but if you are interested in this, uh, many of these trainings are available um, as a self-directed training on our website, learnatwork.ca, and I encourage you to take a look. Uh, the trainings are free, and the most recent one, which has been highly successful, is uh, understanding and responding to sexual violence in immigrant and refugee communities. Um, almost 230, uh, 50 people have taken it in the past year, um, including folks who are doing work in the public health sector, lawyers, settlement workers, students, etc. cetera. Um, and it really provides a really good um, overview of the topic. Um, and um, I think it'll be a really good resource for many of you who are working around violence against women or are interested in the topic. Um, in terms of violence against women, um, as Rani mentioned, oftentimes the context to VAW is, uh, I'm going to use the term VAW quite often, it's the violence against women, um, is uh, put on um, issues around um, culture and we need to shift that to looking at systemic issues in terms of the continuum of violence which uh, women continue to experience is, and is represented by the majority of victims is rooted in social, economic, and political inequity of women. And so the responses to ending this issue of VAW is how also has to be systemic in nature. And violence against women includes intimate personal violence between a, uh, um, an intimate partner, family violence with other family members involved. It in involves um, violence when w that women experience in workplace and in the street and in culture in general. By culture, I mean in the community and society, not a particular culture. Um, since you are at a health conference, here are some examples of, um, well, we are here, here at a health conference, about um, in terms of looking at violence against women as a health issue. Um, oftentimes, the most um, stereotypical um, or the first thing that people think about violence, um, when thinking about violence against women, is physical violence. But abuse, as Rani mentioned, is not just physical, it's emotional, psychological, financial, sexual, spiritual, and, um, you know, reproductive rights. And, um, um, and other issues are involved. Um, there's also a systemic issue, and I'm going to be talking a lot about systems of violence and how to address those in my talk. Um, so by systemic violence, I mean responses from both family, by institutions, and by the state and immigration policies. And many of us will be focusing on that in our um, responses today. So, um, you know, in terms of um, when, when I talk about separation from family, um, you know, I'm talking about immigrants who are here as temporary care, uh, caregivers who are, um, and who are separated from their loved ones and their physical and emotional health is being affected by both the work that they're doing as well as the violence they're perhaps facing in their intimate relationships. Um, you know, uh, there are bills such as uh, Bill C-31 and the Conditional Permanent Residency, which have led to systemic abuse of women who have to stay on in abusive relationships for a period of time in order to maintain their status. And we'll be discussing that both in my uh, presentation as well as my um, colleague Sajidai is going to talk about that too. Um, until recently, r refugee women had very limited access to health care under, uh, under the interim federal health care system. Mental health services are still very limited in terms of um, access for refugees. And this impacts women who may have experienced sexual violence in their country of origin or after coming to Canada. Mental health is also not prioritized in many immigrant communities and is not financially accessible to those who need it. 
Uh, the healthcare system itself uh, is a barrier and causes uh, further abuse to women. Currently, um, there is the Minister's Task Force, Force on the Prevention of Sexual Abuse of Patients and Regulated uh, Professions Act is looking at, to review this uh, professional uh, Health Professions Act and has been listening to testimonies of survivors, service providers, and others on experiences uh, with he uh, the healthcare system and sexual violence perpetrated by uh, healthcare providers. And currently, it's not a survivor central model. So for example, um, I presented at this um, task force and I was asked a question by uh, one of the people, um, the, the chairperson about what I thought of the fact that if a male physician has sexually um, um, uh, you know, abused their female patient, they may still be allowed um, to practice, just not uh, on a female on female patients. I, uh, my response is that that is continuing to. Um, allow for a system of abuse. It's saying that we value your profession and your, uh, you know, talents more than we value the testimony of a survivor. And it's okay, we need you more so you can work with men. No, I think that needs, that framework needs to be challenged and changed. Um, Information is not available in accessible and translated na uh, languages or invisible materials, so women who are in need can often not access those services. And, um, the, the, that's why the immigrant and refugee women often don't access these healthcare services, uh, especially if they're undocumented and don't, don't have access to translation or are in a group that are often rendered invisible by the system that doesn't prioritize them. I'm not going to go over all the statistics because Rani did a good job with that. Uh, you know, uh, we know that violence against women is a major um, issue, not just in terms of social issue, but also a public health issue. Uh, one of the campaigns that I'm working on right now, which I'll talk about later, is the Neighbors, Friends and Family campaign, which is a bystander response to violence against women. Um, and it's interesting to see in our surveys that um, that about 55.8% of people in Ontario would intervene if they saw a woman with bruises or injuries and suspected the partner was the cause. Uh, but this is often very difficult to do, first of all, because violence, again, is not always physical. Um, and oftentimes, people don't know how to intervene. Um, and that is something that we need to talk about in terms of how, how do we respond to instances of, instances of violence that we see happening in our own lives. And to recognize those signs and symptoms. Rani, again, had mentioned about this, this notion of um, challenging stereotypes. So we need to acknowledge that sexual violence does not occur more in racialized communities or within immigrant and refugee communities, and that it's not a cultural issue. And, by sec and not just sexual violence, but violence against women in general. When particular issues of violence against women are presented as ones caused and perpetrated by a particular cultural or faith community, a vicious cycle of racism and racialization ensues uh, that negatively affects communities. And I, it's already impacting our communities in terms of the laws and bills that are out there right now, um, and we need to move move towards an anti-oppression analysis in our work and recognize that violence against women occurs in all cultures and it's based on abuse of power and results in inequality and affects all re relationships through the generations. Okay, I'm going to skip through this, but I think that one thing that no, I'm going to skip through this. Uh, one way to really look at um, violence against women is through, uh, if we want to look at it as a cultural uh, lens, to look at it as from the lens of rape culture, which is defined as a culture in which, in which dominant cultural ideologies, media images, social practices, and societal institutions support and condone sexual abuse by normalizing, trivializing, and eroticizing male violence against women and blaming victims for their own abuse. So, you know, lyrics that we hear in music, advertisements, uh, messages that were told, for, uh, you know, to us by family members, all of those lead to um, a, a rape culture and that we are all a part of, even the ones, of, those of us who are working in this sector. We may be a little bit more aware of it. I'm going to focus on immigration policies, which is kind of a key part of it. System, it's a systemic barrier that many, um, 
immigrant and refugee women face in accessing important services, including violence against women services and access to healthcare, is the immigration system itself, which creates dual tiers of citizenship and groups of people who are welcome to immigrate to Canada versus who are not. I'm not going to go into great detail here, but the pictures here represent two um, instances of Canadian history. Um, so this, there is a historical context of Canadian immigration policies that are racist and xenophobic in nature. This impacts women who are facing multiple barriers, both in terms of family violence, as well as by the immigration system, police, medical system, etc. It's re it renders racialized immigrant and refugee women as unwanted. And the images here, one is of the Komagata Maru. Um, has anyone heard of the Komagata Maru incident? Raise your hand sprinkling of people, which is good, actually more than I expected. So it is a, an example in the 19, early 1900s, um, uh, 1914, I believe, where the Komagata Maru um, sailed from India to Vancouver to with a ship full of um, mainly Sikh, but also uh, Punja uh, Punjabi Sikh, Muslims, and um, Hindus are trying to land in Canada and who are unable to do so and then sent back by the British after months of being just on um, the shoreline and men, and uh, it was the, kind of gives a context to um, who is welcome in the country and who is not because both India and Canada were under the British Empire but there are certain immigrants that are rendered to be uh, more welcome into the country. In terms of the Canadian historical context, the other image is of the uh, Chinese exclusion Act, which in which you know, uh, until a certain point in history, Chinese uh, community members were not allowed to immigrate here or get uh, citizenship, uh, even though they worked on, um, they were brought here as laborers. So, um, and that all the, there's also history of exclusion of you know Japanese uh, Canadians as well. So there's a history to all of this here in Canada. It's nothing new. So there is this notion of a good versus unwanted immigrants. You know, so there is a good immigrant is highly skilled contributes to Canadian society and economy, will not be dependent on state funding, are professionals, and they will eventually get a pathway to citizenship. Unwanted immigrants, on the other hand, and this is not a, um, I, mean, I mean, if I was to do a comprehensive list, we would be here for a while, just giving some examples. So somebody who is a temporary foreign worker, whose labor is just used temporarily, and then they're sent back. Refugees, state-dependent people, those who do the invisible work and are caregivers. And these people have lack of options for permanent status, even though their labor is exploited by the state. In many cases, women in particular are dependent on their spouses for st status, and in other cases, even if they have temporary work permits, they cannot bring their families over. Women working in precarious work conditions such as domestic work um, uh, and caregivers also face sexual violence in addition to workplace violence. So there are two bills that I'm going to talk briefly about. One, uh, well, um, so I'm going to, the, in terms of the state response to gender violence, immigration practice further perpetuates violence against women. Uh, there are two bills that I will talk briefly about. Well, there's the Conditional Permanent Residency and Bill C-31, as well as the Z, uh, bar, um, Bill S-7, which is Zero Tolerance for Barbaric Cultural Practices, whose name itself gives a lot away. So um, the Conditional Permanent Residency, um, Sajid is going to detail about it, but it basically um, enforces this rule that um, if you are being sponsored by your spouse, you have to be in a relationship with them and live in, a, um, in, in, the, in the same home for two years. And that causes a lot of problems for survivors of violence because even if there is a clause that you can get out of it, most immigrants don't know what, how to do so. So it really is a very restrictive bill. Uh, bill C-31 also has led to uh, the, the health care, the uh, uh, access to healthcare, the interim federal healthcare system, which is very has very restrictive um, options for women who are uh, need um, access to healthcare. So. Uh, Bill S-7, which I will talk briefly about, um, and other uh, related policies and regulations is premised on the belief that violence against women is more prevalent in particular communities, including immigrant communities. A 2013 Statistics Canada study, however, found that spousal violence is less prevalent among immigrant communities, uh, immigrant women than Canadian-born women. Further, there is no evidence that violence against women is more likely to occur in certain types of spousal relationships compared to other uh, others. The title of the act 
betrays a flawed ideology that locates violence against women as a cultural issue and also ignores um, the shocking levels of violence against women that occurs every day in Canada across various cultures. Um, one of the things that it does is um, looks at forced, criminalizing forced marriages, uh, but also introduces additional punitive measures through immigration law that seeks to single out immigrants for a double penalty. Under the new proposals, not only perpetrators, but vulnerable members of a family who themselves face coercion are likely to be criminalized and face deportation, thus further endangering women. Uh, the bill will exa exacerbate the vulnerability of women who arrive as sp uh, sponsored spouses um, through the conditional permanent residency. Um, so I think that there is a lot of thought that we have to give into the fact that a lot of these bills will not prevent or end forced marriages uh, or other forms of violence, but can drive it underground and make women more vulnerable by isolating them from their community and not providing them with any other recourse for ensuring that they have status in Canada. Uh, some positive news. We've been hearing a lot of negative things, right? Uh, one thing that I would say has really uh, is a good step is um, the Premier has uh, unveiled this, um, the Sexual Violence Action Plan in March, in which, uh, which focuses on ending vi sexual violence, and it really focuses on rape culture instead of particular communities and culture. And uh, we, uh, OCASI is a part of the provincial roundtable that is meeting to implement this plan, and we hope that it'll be one that takes into account intersectionalities of race, class, gender, sexuality, and immigration status, disability, and more to provide a starting point for important conversations. The other project that we are involved in at um, OCASI is the Neighbors, Friends and Family Project, which is um, a, raises awareness about the warning signs of women abuse and to promote bystander intervention. We're going to be unveiling um, uh, our new, um, 30 seconds, okay, uh, our new uh, updated website on Monday. I, rec um, I urge you to check it out because it's going to have a lot of information uh, that's specific to the immigrant and refugee community. And uh, the agencies that have been involved in this have done some amazing work, including social media. Like we have the, the Newcomer Women's Service is one of the funded agencies that have created this Mamie using a Bollywood image of, um, uh, you know, uh, encouraging people to speak up around violence. Um, and what can we all do? I would say that, you know, what we need to do is mobilize against racist immigration policies, challenge ra rape culture in our everyday lives, talk about sex, sexuality, and consent also in our everyday lives. Um, oftentimes, funding goes to projects for either um, youth or seniors, and the intergenerational work is ignored, so we need to engage in intergenerational work. Peer-based organizing, where you really recognize the lived experiences of people is another um, way to to organize, recognize intersections and build alliances, and you, uh, train and educate using an anti-oppression analysis. So I hope some of you will take the trainings that I mentioned before. And um, you know, we will, um, I'm gonna end it here, and we, hopefully we'll have some time for Q&A. Thank you. Thank you, Kritika. We're gonna hold questions until the end of the panel, if that's okay. Next, we have Sajide Zauri, a community engagement lead at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, with particular interest in working with racialized immigrant and refugee communities. Sajide recently obtained her PhD in social work at the University of Toronto. The focus of her doctoral research was on Iraqi refugee women's everyday experiences of trauma and structural violence in the Canadian context. She's the co-author of the Migrant Mothers Project Policy Report entitled Unprotected, Unrecognized, Canadian Immigration Policy and Violence Against Women, 2008 to 2013. Her talk will focus on the gendered impacts of immigration policy, drawing connections to gender-based violence and mental health of women with precarious status. So join me in welcoming Sajide.
Thank you, Rani, for the introduction, and thank you, Kritika and Rani, for uh, setting a great context for my presentation. Um, I know this is a mental health conference, and I work at the Center for Addiction and Mental Health, but mainly my, uh, the focus of my talk will be on um, the, the relationship between immigration policy and violence against women. And I'm hoping that we will have time in the discussion to talk about the relationship to mental health. Um, so I will start with uh, an overview of uh, my presentation. I will tell you a little bit about the Migrant Mothers Project briefly and my involvement in it. And, um, talk a little bit about the gender analysis of immigration policy report that uh, Rani mentioned. I have one copy here and it's also available on uh, the Migrant Mothers uh, Project website. It's mig migrantmothersproject.com. Uh, There's also uh, other documents such as uh, policy briefs that were produced um, in connection to this project as well as digital stories that Fernanda will be talking about after I speak. Um, I will also talk about the, uh, touch briefly on the political context and disparities in Canadian immigration, which has already been addressed by previous uh, speakers, so I'll touch on it briefly. And um, then talk about um, precarious immigration status and its intersection with violence against women. Um, So the Migrant Mothers Project is a community-based research project uh, that was launched in 2011 and it's, it's um, led by Dr. Rupalim Buyan at the University of Toronto. And it's a partnership with a network of uh, community stakeholders, legal clinics and community health centers uh, that work with women uh, with precarious status and address violence against women issues. And uh, the main focus of the Migrant Mothers Project is to look at the, how immigration policies um, facilitate or contribute to the production of violence against women and uh, create barriers to them uh, seeking safety and security in Canada. And uh, the work, um, as I mentioned, involves a collaboration with a range of stakeholders and uh, there's a community advisory board that is quite involved in forming all the phases of the project. Um, the different, uh, the, uh, my involvement with the community Migrant Mothers Project was mainly through the uh, gender analysis of immigration policies, which we conducted in 2013, and the report was launched in 2014. Um, so the, the goals of the report were to develop a framework for understanding precarious immigration status and um, violence against women, and to identify the impacts of recent immigration policy changes on women's rights and safety, as well as illustrate case examples of policy advocacy across Canada. Um, so this slide highlights the different sections and themes that are um, analyzed in the report. Uh, there are various policies that are covered under each of the sections. Um, and so I won't be able to get into um, those policies due to the limitations of time. And I was just informed I only have five minutes and I've just started. Um, so the research methods that we used in the report were uh, we did the analysis of the various policies um, that were implemented by the federal conservative government in 2008 to 2013. And the reason we focused on that period was because uh, unprecedented changes were introduced to immigration policy during that time period. And um, we also reviewed community-generated research and community commentary on immigration policy changes that are available on the website, uh, on web uh, sources, listservs, and media, as well as we conducted interviews with service providers, academics, researchers, and policymakers working in different regions, such as Vancouver, Montreal, and Toronto. We also conducted uh, community forums and a day-long symposium, which was held last summer, to present the findings and 
and seek feedback from community stakeholders. So the scope of the report doesn't cover the recent uh, policy changes that were uh, implemented in 2014, such as the Strengthening Canadian Citizenship Act, which introduced significant changes to the citizenship policies, as well as the Bill S-7, with, which uh, Kritika mentioned briefly. There were other changes uh, that are continuing to happen, so I won't be touching on those um, in this report. Um, I will skip over the political context because of the time, but just briefly mention that uh, one of the key things that the conservative government has done is defunding of a lot of organizations that are social justice oriented and uh, addressing the uh, rights of violent, uh, violence against women sector, as well as uh, significant cuts to the status of women office, cuts to uh, research funding and uh, barring advocacy, particularly for organizations that are funded by citizens Citizenship and Immigration Canada. And also, uh, one of the other key features of this government is anti-immigrant sentiments and criminalization of migrants. Uh, uh, so using uh, discourses such as marriage frauds and bogus refugees and a lot of emphasis on criminalization has been one of the key aspects of it. The other um, feature of immigration policy uh, that relates to gender is that um, that I wanted to touch on is a trend toward, uh, which has been historical and has been touched on is uh, the fact that racialized women continue to be occupied in low income and low status uh, positions in the labor market. Uh, for example, 95% of economic migrants from the Living Caregiver Program are females and mostly from the Philippines. And in recent years, there has been a steady increase in the proportion of women in refugee and asylum seeking um, stream of immigration, uh, which has re reached as high as 50% in 2012. So I've referred to precarious immigration status a lot, so I wanted to provide a definition of that which has been offered by Goldring and her colleagues. And it refers to individuals who are residing in Canada but do not have access to the same rights uh, that permanent residents and citizens, uh, citizens um, in Canada have. Uh, so rights such as being able to travel in and out of Canada or work legally and the right to choose which employers to work with or change employers and the right to not be dependent on sponsors such as spouses or um, employers who are bringing, who are um, sponsoring them in the country for their immigration status. And um, also the rights to uh, access social entitlements and safety net programs such as education, healthcare, and housing. Uh, so people get into precarious immigration status through various pathways, such as temporary foreign worker program or international students or um, people who have entered Canada on a visitor's visa and, and uh, their visa has expired. Um, so in terms of the intersection of precarious status and violence against women, um, Kritika mentioned the conditional permanent residence pr uh, program, and that's a regulation that was introduced in 2012 with the justification that uh, the government wanted to protect the integrity of the Canadian state from uh, threats of marriage fraud without really providing any statistics or uh, justification to show how much marriage fraud was actually taking place. Um, so the bill um, or the regulation faced a lot of opposition from the start when it was introduced by various groups from the violence against women sector um, and uh, other community groups that are advocating for women's rights. And basically the regulation stipulates that two-year conditional period uh, women have to reside with their, cohabit with their uh, sponsors uh, in a conjugal relationship and prove that they are um, living together. And they could be subject to investigation by CBSA and uh, random assessments on an ongoing uh, basis during the two-year period. 
so there is an exception clause that is put in place for women who are in abusive relationships, but often women choose to stay or decide, they have to stay in that relationship because their immigration status depends on that. And um, they end up, um, even when they leave, um, they face other consequences such as losing their um, their uh, immigration status and being detained or deported. Um, so I am run, running out of time, <laughs> but uh, I wanted to touch on Bill C-31. I think I will leave that for now to allow time for the other speakers. Thank you. Thank you, Sajideh. I'll now introduce Fernanda Villanueva. Fernanda was born in Chile and grew up in Toronto, Canada. She received her MSW from the University of Toronto and is currently working as a health promoter at Women's Health in Women's Hands Community Health Center for the past 10 years. Oh no, I'm sorry, not for the past 10 years. For the past 10 years, Fernanda has worked in the areas of mental health, women's health and well-being, violence against women, working with immigrant, refugee, and non-status women. These experiences have led her to work from an anti-oppressive lens with a deep understanding and consideration of the many intersections that impact the health of individuals. Fernanda will be speaking about her work at Women's Health and Women's Hands, and she will also share a digital story of one of the women that she encountered in her work with the Migrant Mothers Project. So welcome, please welcome Fernanda. Hello everyone. Um, so I'm here from Women's Health and Women's Hands and I'll be presenting on um, our holistic approach that we use at the center. Okay. So to provide, we are, well, Women's Health and Women's Hands is a community health center, and our mandate is to provide primary health care to racialized women from the African, Black, Caribbean, Latin American, and South Asian communities in Toronto and surrounding municipalities. We are committed to working from an inclusive feminist, pro-choice, anti-racist, anti-oppression, and multilingual participatory framework in addressing the issues of access to health care for our mandated priority populations encompassing gender, gender identity, race, class, violence, sexual orientation, religion, culture, language, disability, immigration status, and socioeconomic circumstances. And that is a lot. And often I say that it's each one of those things could be a PhD. Um, I wanted to get you to take a look at the demographics that we serve. So at our health center, 42% um, of the clients, they identify as Afro-Caribbean. 23% identifies African, 10% identifies Latin American, and 9% as South Asian, and so on. In terms of our um, family income a year, we have 42% of our clients report earning less than 15,000 a year. 21% um, say they earn between 15 to 24,000 a year, and 8% say they earn between 25 to 34,000 a year. In terms of reasons for accessing services, um, it does vary, but as you can see, we have depression is the number one reason why clients come to our center. Um, health maintenance, preventative medicine, um, psychological symptoms, poverty, financial problems, hypertension, assault, harmful events, um, menopause and pregnancy, PTSD and diabetes. The clients at Women's Health and Women's Hands, um, the majority of our clients are immigrants, refugees, or have precarious immigration status. Our clients come from war-torn countries, have histories of violence, and have struggled with trauma at pre- and post-migration. Clients struggle with comorbidities, so mental health concerns include depression, anxiety, PTSD. Um, chronic illnesses include HIV, diabetes, and high blood pressure, amongst others. So what do we do when we have very marginalized um, community members at our center? So we work from, um, one of the frameworks that we work from is really understanding social determinants of health. Uh, so in order to improve our clients' health, we need to understand the social factors that contribute to poor health. 
We have to take into consideration the environmental, um, social, political, and economic factors that create inequities in health. Uh, and these can include gender, sexual orientation, racism and discrimination, poverty, social exclusion, migration, immigration status, um, food and housing insecurity. So it really is a layer of many different um, factors that impact someone's health in terms of them actually even achieving good health. Um, the way that we incorporate the social determinants of health at the center is actually by fostering um, most of our programs and services from that lens. So we have primary health care providers, therapists, social workers. Um, we have food bank that, that clients access as well as housing support, um, immigration consultants who come into our center to provide services for the clients. We have pre and post natal care as well as groups. Um, physical activity classes because you really realize that with physical activity you can target both mental health concerns as well as physical, physical concerns. We have anonymous HIV testing um, and programs for HIV positive women. And within this, we also try to foster a sense of community with a strong sense of belonging and acceptance for our clients. So oftentimes, you know our clients' names. Um, we know about their life stories. We connect with them one-on-one. -on -one. Um, in addition, one of the frameworks that we use is an anti-oppression approach. And so this can, again, be a large conversation, but I'm going to try and minimize it and keep it very short and sweet. Um, one is that we actually try to it's constant reflection and we try to acknowledge that every woman has a unique story and she is the expert in her own life. Um, we often think that we are the ones that have to give people advice, but we frame it on the lens that they are the ones that need to tell us what they can and cannot do. Um, recognizing a woman's right to be treated with dignity and respect at all times. Encouraging active participation of women in decision making concerning their health care and recognizing the multiple and intersecting dimensions of oppression that impact individuals. And so in terms of different layers of oppression, I often view them as layers. So there's gender, race, culture, economic status, sexual orientation, abilities, violence, immigration, and it can go on and on. Um, and the more that people can identify with one of these, oftentimes the heavier, um, or the heavier their bag feels, right? Um, also from working from an anti-oppression um, perspective, we have to really consider power and privilege. And so understanding our own privilege and our social location in our society. So we have doctors, nurses, social workers, um, I'm the health promoter there, but we have to really realize that the fact that we're even employed at the center gives us some form of privilege. Um, we have to understand the power differences between service providers and clients. So the fact that we have learned a lot of um, knowledge gives us a bit of a power and balance in terms of um, where we are in comparison to the client. And that's why we try to really advocate for the clients to let us know what they can and cannot do and what they do want. Um, we also use our power and privilege to influence and create positive change, facilitate and work towards equity, and support marginalized individuals and groups to mobilize and build capacity for self-determination. There's lovely birds <laughs> flying around. Um, I also want to bring it back to actually the City of Toronto. So I want you to realize that the clients that are actually at Women's Health and Women's Hands, they are the clients, um, or they are community members. They live in the GTA, um, they work in the GTA, they take the transit just like we all do. Um, almost half of Toronto population was born outside of Canada with over 140 languages spoken. So really we have a very, very diverse community here in the city. Um, 47. 47% of Toronto's population reported themselves as being part of a racialized group. And that also, as Sajidae was saying, can lead to other factors such as underemployment, um, difficulty accessing different services, and so on and so forth. Um, and I want you all to take what I have just shared and what we have all shared and really see where you can connect and learn new things um, from the clients that you see or from the people that you interact with on a daily basis. Um, often talking about race, gender inequality, violence is very difficult, but I challenge you all to be comfortable with the uncomfortable. Um, so I'm going to present a digital story. So I was also part of the Migrant Mothers Project and about three years I had the opportunity of working with women who all had precarious immigration status. Um, and we created, well not we, they decided to create and um, they really actually wanted to share their voices and allow people to see who they are. Um, they had lots of fear at times and so that's why everything is actually anonymous. Um, 
but they did want to share their stories. And so this is just one woman uh, in the city of Toronto with precarious immigration status. And I want you to think about the various forms of oppression that she has um, and where you also can connect and cannot connect. Siempre he sido una mujer muy alegre y me encanta estar rodeada de mucha gente. Ayudar a los demás y hacer algo por mi comunidad. Pero muy en el interior de mí, abriendo mi corazón y quitando esa corteza que tapa mi ser, queda todo el dolor que aflora en mi vida. Sin querer mostrar al mundo la realidad de mi sufrir. Y más ahora que estoy luchando por querer ser la mujer de antes. En este país, mi situación migratoria, el rechazo, la impotencia que vengo sintiendo por lo que me está tocando vivir. Pero no quiero dejarme vencer. Día a día he notado que esto me está obligando a llegar a donde nunca quise que muchas personas llegaran. La soledad, la depresión y el miedo. Lo más duro es saber que la lucha, que un día gané saliendo de mi país con mis tres hijos para buscar seguridad, tranquilidad y protección. Hoy este país me la arrebata, separándome de mi hijo menor y dejándome en la impotencia de no poder tener a los otros junto a mí. Una mañana... Escuché tres fuertes golpes en la puerta de mi departamento y el silencio a una respuesta inmediata. En segunda escuché una voz fuerte, somos emigración. Me tiré de la cama, corrí, abrí la puerta. Sin darme cuenta que traían puesto encima, abrí y vi un hombre y una mujer. Al verlos con sus trajes negros, sus camisas blancas impecables y esos chalecos que usan que no sé qué decir, miedo, terror, impotencia. Ahora pienso que Dios me dio mucha sabiduría y fuerza para poder responderle las preguntas a los oficiales de migración. Les pedí disculpas y ellos me mostraron un papel con la foto de mi hijo menor. Ellos preguntaron, ¿él vive acá? Sí, respondí. ¿Cómo se llama? Miguel. ¿Dónde están? En el colegio. ¿Cómo se llama el colegio? ¿Él sabe que tiene una cita mañana de migración? Sí, respondí. Yo inmediatamente me di cuenta que se iban a llevar a mi hijo y que sería deportado. Entonces reaccioné y les pedí a los oficiales que por favor permitieran que mi hijo se graduara. Ellos contestaron, dígale que no olvide la cita de mañana. Y se despidieron. Yo cerré la puerta y me desplomé. Me puse a llorar, estuve temblando y sentí miedo, mucho, mucho miedo. Y fue cuando me di cuenta de la impotencia de no poder hacer absolutamente nada. De saber que es mi hijo menor. Lo único que tenía acá. Lo único que me queda de mi familia por la que luché desde que salí de Colombia hace 15 años. Después de la cita de mi hijo, lo dejaron graduarse. Pero al llegar el mes siguiente, a mi hijo lo deportan y se lo llevaron. Y me separaron de él sin importarles nada. 
Hay dos cosas que han dejado huella y profundo dolor en mi vida por este largo proceso de migración fallido. El no haber podido despedirme de mi madre y acompañarla en su funeral. Y el día cuando me arrebatan a mi hijo y me lo deportan sabiendo que él está solo en otro país y se encuentra sufriendo por mí y yo aquí sola. También sufriendo por él. Y que esto está causando secuelas en su vida y aún más profundas de las que han formado todos estos largos años. Este es el dolor más grande que este país ha dejado de mí. Respiro profundo y comienzo a pensar y a pasar mis imágenes en mi cabeza. La salida de Colombia, la salida de Estados Unidos y ahora el rechazo de Canadá. Siento la angustia de no poder hacer nada para poder estar con mis hijos. Que todo está llegando al final, los días empiezan a veces cortos, sin claridad y las noches a veces largas y oscuras, a creer que llegaremos a un man amanecer. Estoy en ese momento donde siento que si no me caigo me empujan. Luego me dan la orden de deportación y acá sigo, luchando por demostrarle a este país que soy una más de las emigrantes capaces de salir adelante que no somos una carga, que salimos con nuestros propios recursos, que trabajamos noche y día, que queremos integrarnos a esta sociedad canadiense. Solamente necesitamos que nos den una oportunidad, una sola, una sola oportunidad. Um, so yeah, that was one of the five digital stories that have been created through the Migrant Mothers Project. Um, just a couple of things that I want to say about that. So that is also within the context of violence against women. So that woman had a long history of violence both um, in her home country and also um, in other places as well. Uh, the other thing that I also wanted to mention is that um, one of the things that really just makes women South and women's hands um, really critical, I would say, is the fact that we provide health care to women regardless of their immigration status. Um, and so here you can see that most people do actually need access to many different things, mental health, physical health, sense of community, and also sense of belonging. Thank you very much. Thanks, Fernanda. Now, last but not least is Anu Dugal, who serves as the Director of Violence Prevention Programs at the Canadian Women's Foundation. She's currently responsible for national strategies related to violence against women and girls, teen violence prevention, including sex trafficking, and her work includes grant making, knowledge mobilization, program enhancement, and coalition building. 
Anu's remarks will focus on the intersection of violence against women and women's mental and physical health. The Canadian Women's Foundation has prioritized work on mental health, substance abuse, and violence, looking especially closely at how shelters can be inclusive spaces, especially when race, cultural identity, language barriers, or other forms of marginalization are present. So please welcome Anu. Thank you very much, Rani, and thank you everyone for uh, your patience this afternoon. Um, there are obviously many things that have been said by my colleagues, so I'll be flipping through as I go. Um, and th one thing I do want uh, just to highlight is that um, the experience of the women in the digital stories is uh, in many ways similar to um, an experience that you might have as a migrant. Um, I myself have been uh, undocumented in Spain, I've had visitor status in many countries, uh, I've had student permits in different countries in Europe, I've been an Indian citizen, a British citizen, and now a Canadian citizen. What is important to note in my privilege, and I want to note it now, is that luckily for me, I did not experience a lot of those uh, experiences because hazardous moments were buffered in my life thanks to education, money, privilege, having a white mother, having a white partner, not being too dark, and also having a British accent. And all of those things have definitely put me in a place where I hope I can at least speak for women, but at the same time recognize where my experiences do not in any way reflect the terrible pain that so many women have experienced. Um, I also think that um, while identity is fluid, um, I can to a certain extent control how I'm perceived. Race and gender for me are not fluid. Uh, they only change in as much as the people around me behave differently depending on how they perceive me. Um, so by way of background, the Canadian Women's Foundation is Canada's largest public foundation supporting women and girls. Our mission is to empower women and girls across Canada to move out of violence, out of poverty and into confidence. Uh, we take a systemic approach to address root causes on the most critical issues facing women and girls in Canada. And we carefully select and fund programs with stronger outcomes while regularly evaluating our work. First of all, the importance of evidence-informed care in uh, frontline services is one thing we look at very carefully. Um, we do look at some experimentation in the field, and one of the examples is the uh, a sort of holistic new wave, singing, prayer, retreat kind of uh, approach to violence against women, which is emerging. We have seen that this is there's certain stages where certain types of activity can happen depending on where a woman is on the healing um, cycle. Um, and there are certain things that are better done at the end and certain things better done at the beginning. So one of the things we've seen that seems to work at the six month um, cycle when uh, um, women are in group settings is a mindfulness approach in, uh, in their healing uh, approach. So I think that's something that we've learned that we've seen makes a big difference. Um, and we're funding programs that include that, whether they're healthy relationships programs or um, programs in shelters. Um, it's very important to recognize the state of the woman who you are face-to-face -face within a care setting. Um, and one thing that we also support is the trauma-informed approach, um, the, which I think could be implemented in many, many healthcare settings. Um, some of the things about why a woman is not exercising, is not taking her medication, is not um, following prescribed uh, healthcare uh, outlines that have been la laid out for her, uh, is informed by the trauma she's experiencing. Um, and I think it's important to think about what she can actually deal with at each stage in her healing journey. She can't take on all of these things at once. We support a trauma-informed care approach, especially with women who've been trafficked. Um, in the early recovery stages, um, women who've been trafficked need uh, lots of sleep and lots of food. Um, they might spend three weeks in a setting where um, all that they are responding to is their most basic needs. Uh, they have been without control for many, many months, days, years, however long they've been in a traffic situation. Um, and the first thing that they can re-establish control is over how they eat and how they sleep. Um, 
And although women, most women in Canada who've been trafficked have uh, come from within Canada, there is a significant number who are from outside Canada and they need very intense support. They are also largely undocumented. Um, and so the immediate concerns are health related and that's why services such as uh, Fernanda mentioned to us who will take a woman um, in a healthcare setting regardless of her documentation is essential for uh, collaboration between community groups and healthcare services. One of the things we look at is also the additional supports that are needed, whether it's language, interpretation, uh, disability, um, travel and transportation. Um, and that's one thing when we're looking at our grant proposals, we actually include an additional money amount, a resource that is offered to grantees so that they can fund those additional services. It's not part of their regular work. They don't get funded from it anywhere else. It should be considered an additional expense. And I know that healthcare workers are also very often paying out of their own pockets for some of those things. We've heard of healthcare workers in Calgary who are paying for rape crisis kits uh, because the healthcare system won't pay for them. Um, and it's our, uh, our hope that the more we can educate, the more we can get closer to understanding how much those additional supports are important and an essential service, not an add-on service. Um, another issue that we're seeing is data collection. It's actually very, very hard to have um, good data from shelters or from community services because they're not trained in that, because it's not their primary focus, because it's not easy for them to collect that information and it's not part of the, uh, the trust relationship that they're building. And the problem with that is that it's harder to tailor services if we don't have the data to back up what we actually need to tailor them to. Um, so, for example, uh, why do women not go to services? Or when they get to a healthcare setting, what is their experience? We don't have a lot of information on that. And that is something that I would like to see in the mainstream healthcare, more information on gathering that information, more time and um, focus gathering that information so that we can successfully tailor our services. And I think I would just um, mention a few things that you might not know. In a sheltered system, um, women do not have access to their medication. They are locked up in a room and they have to ask um, for access to any medication that they have. They are very unlikely to disclose any sort of mental health or physical health um, issues because they are scared of being labeled. And then the shelter workers themselves don't want to pass on that information because they don't want women they are working with to be labeled. Um, so this is why a trauma-informed practice approach is so important. Um, and why when you talk about a women-centered approach, re-establishing the power and control that a woman has over her body, over her integrity, over herself, is an essential part of what you can do when a woman has experienced violence. Um, and <laughs> I don't think we can discuss reporting violence against women. It's a bit choppy because I'm skipping over large sections without looking at um, Islamophobia and racism as a whole. Um, a few things that haven't been mentioned, women who are born, even women who are born in Canada find reporting extremely difficult because it's seen as a betrayal of their community. Um, and they are extremely conscious of how mainstream healthcare police service or uh, social services judge where they are and who they are. Um, and they see their men being blamed as um, representatives of a widely repressive culture rather than as individuals, which is how white males are often judged in a violent setting. So um, I didn't get to talk about fem female genital cutting, but if you have any questions about that, I can up against that in the, uh, the last section. Thank you very much. No, you didn't expect to see me. Uh, we, I'm just trying to organize the Q&A session. I invite all of the uh, panelists to go there. And while they do that, I would like to invite all of you to just talk to your neighbor about the most important questions, select a question, and then uh, we do a Q&A, which will be limited to uh, a limited number of questions, but uh, that may be one way how we get a little bit more of interaction in this very stiff room. So please talk to your neighbor and then come up for the Q&A to the microphone. Thanks a lot.
sorry, the mics are not on. Is this on? Yeah, this is on. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah, thank you very much for the lovely presentations and the video clip, which uh, was very moving, but uh, tells the rea reality on the ground. Just uh, uh, three quick questions. Is that, uh, has the differences in ethnic origin, uh, is there any differences in violence uh, against women between the different ethnic uh, backgrounds that after they come over here? Has that been studied, number one? Number two, uh, Kritika, in your uh, uh, presentation, you had one slide which showed that about 1,000 violence against women, uh, 13 reported and three convicted. Mm -hmm. And the last speaker also alluded to this. But uh, why is it so low, number one? And is, is anything being done to sensitize the police forces, law enforcement, for, uh, to be more gender sensitive uh, to than otherwise, which we know in most South, East, South Asia countries is a major uh, detriment. And my last, uh, last comment is, are there any services for men? We are talking everything about women. But you just said that when a person comes here, highly qualified, completely disgruntled, frustrated, and get, goes into anger and, and stress, etc. Is there any service available for them, or could that be thought of? Um, so that's actually, well, I'm gonna, we're going to start from the end. So are there any services for men? Um, working at a women's community health center uh, that prioritizes women and racialized women, we often get asked that. Um, but actually, there are women's, um, uh, the community health center is actually one out of 70 in Ontario that offer services um, to anybody, really. And a lot of, there's other community health centers that offer services to both men and women. Um, so we have Access Alliance does a really great job. They focus on um, immigrants and refugees, both men and women, as well as many other um, community health centers in the city. And there's about 30 in the GTA, so we can talk afterwards. Yeah, mental health services, the same framework. So primary health care, mental health services, groups, programs for both men and women. The only thing that I have heard is that oftentimes the groups tend to be, um, men don't access them as often, but they are available. Um, also to add to that, I think what is, um, uh, uh, for those of us who have done like grassroots work um, in, in immigrant communities, one of the things that we've been seeing for decades now is the need for really bringing in men as allies in the movement against violence against women because men are not, I mean, it is just a very stereotypical to just uh, characterize all men as perpetrators of violence when men can be supporters. Men are um, also, um, you know, um, our friends, our uh, brothers and fathers and just you know people in the community and many men don't believe in violence and it's something and I think when men speak to other men about these issues it is much more powerful than us going and being like down with violence you know because they're just going to roll their heads and be like oh these feminists you know so I think uh, if you are a man who cares about this issue it's time to like stop like um, you know, it's time to take action, basically, you know, even in a small way, you know, uh, in, in, in terms of what you do at home, in terms of talking to your colleagues, if somebody says something sexist, to not just be like, ha-ha, because everybody's laughing. So there are small things that people can do, um, you know, uh, other than, you know, the bigger policy analysis picture. Uh, in terms of your question on um, ethnic origin, can you, like, what, was it that is there differences in violence? I mean, there are differences in which violence is perpetrated perpetuated in different communities. It is not specific, again, to a particular community. It's just that it is, um, you know, it, it manifests itself in different ways based on uh, particular circumstances. Um, so, but I think the, the larger thing should be to look at violence from a more, like moving from just a particular cultural context to the context of rape culture and structural violence. That's the way we can end violence for everybody and shift it from being um, something that only ha uh, happens in particular communities because the st statistics that you alluded to in your second question was not specific to a 
local community. It is specific to all Canadians. So it's about uh, what the statistics said, out of every 1,000 sexual assaults in Canada, only 33 are reported to police and three lead to conviction. So this is not like the South Asian or the Arab or, um, you know, this is like white, black, Hispanic, everybody, you know? And so the, why does this happen? I think one of the things is we live in a culture of victim blaming. It takes a lot for somebody to go and report, especially if it's something that's a, um, happening within the house and the home and to say that, oh, my husband did this. And especially when we uh, heard about how women are dependent on their spouses for immigration status. I will con like, let my colleagues continue. Uh, maybe just to answer a little bit more about the men's programs, we have uh, the PAR programs, which are programs all across Ontario to um, prevent uh, assault um, for men who've been identified as being um, as assaulting their partners. They're open to everyone. And also um, in the teen healthy relationships programs, and I would say a lot of the new sex ed curriculum that's coming into Ontario, that will be an education piece that will be as important for young men as it is for young women. Um, and I really support that any prevention program includes young men. I just wanted to mention about the, your question around police and working with police. There was a movement in the city of Toronto um, around uh, creating safe spaces and shelters so that police don't go into the shelter and uh, attempt to deport women because there were a lot of instances where police would go to schools and shelters and knowing that there are non-status women there to deport them. So there has been some work and education done around that and it stopped for a period of time but unfortunately it's not all always enforced, so it's an ongoing attempt that needs to happen. Is there anything else that you want to add? And also the training, I think trainings need to be occurring to everybody in the police force, not just like particular, as usually like we see them all at the con these conferences where one or two of them come and be like, I'm representing, you know, I work on violence against women, but this training needs to be for all police, not just specific. Should we take one more or should we just, just one more question. My, uh my question is about uh, whether there is any difference in terms of violence committed by uh, intimates. Um, whether there is a difference uh, between intra-racial and interracial uh, relationships. Those people who are interracial and uh, intra-racial uh, relationships. Whether there is a difference between uh, the level of violence uh, uh, that happens. The other question I have is, how do you actually uh, articulate the, uh, um, your opposition or I mean the, your initiatives in terms of culturally based uh, violence against women, for example, like genital mutilation, as against uh, a general overarching, uh, overarching uh, uh, initiatives uh, that deals with the general issues of violence against women. The other question too is, and this is in connection with the, uh, with the previous uh, questionnaire. Um, how do you, how do you uh, integrate in initiatives, in, in, in terms of the initiatives, in terms of collect, I mean, correcting the situations in the community uh, the assistance that are available to men in terms of uh, their own problems with violence against, you know, like, th that may be culturally uh, uh, based or something. Okay, so the first question about um, uh, whether interracial or intraracial relationships are more violent, we, we always uh, repeat as many times as we can, the violence is about patriarchy, the violence is not about the race. Um, and no matter what community you're in, the, uh, the, the male power is uh, more um, uh, of an issue than the, than the differential of power between race. It's all about power and control. Um, and we, while we might say some partners might use their race as an excuse, or they might use different races, or they might think that they are going to be in a relationship where they will have more power and control because of the different nature of the power and control between those couples, that is not, they would have established their power and control regardless of the race of their partner. 
Um, and I think that's really essential to, uh, to highlight as many times as we can. Um, in terms of initiatives to men, I think it really starts from the like uh, at home, right? Uh, we can have a lot of initiatives that are public, like, you know, funded by agencies and all, but if we are not raised in a manner that is challenging uh, the existing kind of um, gender roles and norms, we're still going to continue with the uh, what we have right now. So, the, if those of you who are parents and have kids, um, and no matter what the age, it's, it's time to start talking about you know challenging yourself to not um, you know uh, continue with stereotypes and to be like, oh my. My daughter has to be home by six. My son can come and play soccer and be home by nine. Challenge yourself as to why you're doing that. Start talking about how to build healthy relationships and respect and mutuality and consent. Um, and um, again, I think initiatives to men exist. It, it can be something as simple as just having like um, you know a group of men talking about you know what is a healthy relationship and you know um, and those th those discussions unfortunately don't happen a lot organically. But that's something that as men, those of you who are here in the audience, we can start thinking about how do you want to take accountability on a personal level? Because we are not going to sit here. We could. We don't have the time to tell. There is no like formula, but there are certain things you can do in terms of even like starting at home, which is I think much more powerful than like you know something that's like here is our project because that will change future generations. So thank you, everyone. I think we're out of time, uh, and thank you to the panelists. And thank you for your um, patience.